This week, Don Pizzette joins us from IT Pro TV to talk about how to secure those devices in your home that attackers have been taking advantage of lately. So stay tuned. This is a Security Weekly production. Brought to you by IT Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. IT Pro TV offers 1,000 hours of up to date, high quality video training content. Course topics include certified cloud security professional, ethical hacking, cryptography, and VMware. You can stream their courses live or on demand to your mobile device, all for one low monthly subscription price and cancel at any time. Visit ITProTV forward slash hack naked to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications. Use the code HN30 for a free seven day trial and get 30% off for life. Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. Welcome everyone to Hack Naked News. That's right, filling in for the illustrious Aaron Lyons uh, who couldn't make it today. Um, This is, what episode number is this? We just started doing... 98, thank you. This is episode 98. I couldn't find it fast enough uh, before they cut back <laughs> from the commercial. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm, of course, Paul Asadorian, uh, the founder and CEO of Security Weekly and CEO of Offensive Countermeasures. And I have with me on the lines via Skype from the shiny new IT Pro TV headquarters, I have Don Petzl here with us. Welcome, Don. Hey, Paul. Nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes. Nice to have you on the show. Uh, our like newly reskinned hack naked news. I'm loving all the the new logos. And Don and I, uh, we are actually on the same wavelength. What we want to talk about today, because of these gigantic botnets, now for the second time, have come out, taken advantage of embedded systems or IoT devices on the internet, largely ones that are in people's homes, although some of them, uh, which is interesting, what what I think some of the devices are uh, as well. Um, so we wanted to focus on some of the content that IT Pro TV has uh, in terms of training people up on how to secure it. I think a lot of our listeners know, but we need you to pass that knowledge down and maybe encourage some other people who don't know to get the appropriate knowledge and training. IT Pro TV is, of course, a great place to do that. But Don, let's talk about well, what types of devices are being used in these attacks. All right, so uh, some of the really common ones that we're seeing are are DVRs, you know, just your digital video recorders, devices that pretty much every cable company hands out for five bucks a month these days. So real, real low barrier to entry where any any person out there can get one. Um, We're also seeing webcams because the nanny cams, the just home monitors, even the pet cameras that people get. A lot of these people just jump on Amazon. They buy the cheapest one they can find. They plug it in the network and they go. And those devices seem to be the primary target for a lot of this. But obviously, there's a ton of Internet of Things. Any kind of IoT device is, is a potential exploit point for this. Yeah, it's interesting. When I, when I see an attack like this, I tend to theorize, like, why is, are these devices on the Internet? And for the webcam, the cam, cameras, there's a great reason for that is because people want to get them remotely. So they're either on the internet directly or they're opening up holes in their firewall or what I think is more than likely the case, as I've experienced uh, even in retail establishments, that their firewall that you get from the uh, internet provider, uh, in this case Verizon Fios, has universal plug and play enabled by default. When you plug that DVR or that camera in, and I think it's the same use case for both, it instructs the firewall to basically drop shields to those devices. Yeah, and and usually with UPnP, there's not really any security tied to it, so the devices can ask for whatever port they want. And now, if it's the device doing what it's supposed to do, that's not so bad, but where we really get at risk is somebody could compromise that device and then use UPnP to open up whatever they wanted in the firewall to be able to, able to access that that network to be able to get into what is normally your private network. And right. you know, UPnP is a concern. I, 
I've also had issues with just the, the, the people that install these devices, like a cable installer, mm-hmm. you know, somebody comes out to, to put in a cable modem. And I've had them tell me things like, uh, you know, your, your router does NAT. So all of your devices have private IPs. Your network is secure. Nobody can get at it. And that just shows people not understanding how network address translation works and that, that lack of knowledge, even even for an installer, because they don't they don't normally get the greatest training. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. I, I'm also in, I'm kind of puzzled though how Telnet ends up exposed to the internet, <laughs> <laughs> and I think a lot of that's because well, people don't know what what ports are and they don't know what ports to open, so just open all of them to this device and hey, look, it works. That's great, it works, uh, and that's of course really bad. Um, you have, uh, at IT Pro TV, you have some training on home router configuration, which I think is very timely and I think important for much of the community, security community listening to the show. Most of us know that we have to change the default passwords and do all of this stuff to secure our devices. But I want to make sure that we're enabling the next, uh, people down the line that may not have that knowledge, uh, and get them that knowledge. And some of your online modules, I think are a great starting point. Yeah, you know, every router is, is different, but the concepts and the theory are the same. You know, just the the ability to to do port forwarding to secure that access. But mm-hmm. where we're really running into challenges is that these kind of home routers, they're not quite enough. A lot of them do have firewalls built into them, but remember that most firewalls allow all access going out, and then you filter the access coming in. So you, you kind of control just one direction of that traffic. That's how, how most firewalls work by default, and where that gets really challenging are some of these Internet of Things devices. And I, I can give you a great example. Uh, if you go on Amazon and do a search for uh, an easy to set up webcam for your home, some of the cheapest ones, some of the most commonly bought ones are from a company called Foscam, uh, yep. F-O-S-C-A-M. Uh, they're out there. I've got one in my house, right? And we have uh, two kids and a nanny and I, I want to see what's going on in the house. And so we have a little camera that sits there in the living room. And when I got that, I, I knew that these devices, they, they go features first, security second, mm-hmm. right? Security is kind of on the back burner. So when I threw it on the network, I said, all right, well, you know, I can just take a router and I can I can port forward. I can kind of restrict what access it has. But what I found was that those devices, they have a lot of technology in them to make it easy to get set up so that somebody who knows nothing about IT can plug in a cable and then fire up an app on their phone anywhere in the world and access the camera. And the way this device worked was by phoning home. It would phone home to servers that were, in this case, they were in China. Uh, It would phone home to those servers. And when you fired up the app, you were reaching out to those same servers to find your device. So even if you had a firewall that blocked all access coming in, if it allowed access going out, these devices would build that connection and you'd kind of lose that security. They were were weakening your firewall just by being on your network. And so what we find a lot of times is that, yes, there's things you can do to secure your router. You can change the Wi-Fi password, change the admin password, restrict access to the admin panel, all those things that we normally do. But you really need to get a good firewall in there. And most homes just don't have a firewall. And what I ended up doing was taking my Foscam, and I have a a PFSense firewall that I use in my own home, and I basically said, that Foscam is not allowed to talk to the internet. I completely blocked that going out. And then if I ever want to access that camera, I use OpenVPN, I VPN home, Mm -hmm. and then I can hit the camera and view it. And when I drop my VPN, I know that camera's isolated. But I had to actively block traffic going out. And that's something that that very few people do in a home environment. In business, very common. Mm -hmm. At home, very uncommon. Well, even in a lot of smaller uh, retail places, which I have some experience with actually a a good friend of mine that um, has a shop right down the street from the studio, uh, does a lot of consulting with with retail shops and tells me all kinds of, uh, well, neat things about the technology he implements for them. And they're much better after he leaves, obviously. But, you know, it's deplorable that like what happens at some of these even smaller uh, retail shops. Uh, I do want to mention that, you know, whether it's a home or a retail shop or a business, I think people still have this attitude like, ah, who's going to want to hack into my camera or my DVR? And, you know, how would they even find it? And uh, basically, I, like three quick things on that. Well, one... You can scan the entire internet really fast today, and, and people are doing that and making the data available, right? We've seen Shodan, we've seen HD Moore, uh, and others present on that. And the other thing is, when I was doing a lot more uh, what I termed embedded device security research uh, years ago, and now they call it IoT research, there are ways to find these devices. And Don, you hit on a great point. You said a lot of these cheaper devices will phone home to a central point. If the attackers can get into that central point or any kind of central data, 
that gives away the IP addresses of all of those devices, now they can compromise all of them. So if the attackers, for example, they know what the default usernames and passwords are, if they were to compromise the server in China that they're phoning home to, or I've described in previous talks methods of using NTP and methods of using uh, dynamic DNS providers to be able to detect these devices. So in the NTP example, there was actually an NTP server you could connect to, and it spits back all of the clients that are connected to it. That's a configuration in NTP. And if you find an NTP server, like the one that we found, that was used by no, a specific model router, well, now I just have a whole list. I, I actually got, like, I think it was around 20,000 IP addresses that were all that same model router. So that, <laughs> that contributes a lot to building my botnet. Um, also, with the dynamic DNS, you mentioned you connect back to your home. A lot of people have a dynamic IP address, which means that I'm going to go to one of these dynamic DNS providers so that my name's always the same and it updates the record when my IP address changes, obviously. Um, you could, uh, at one time, there were certain providers that you could do a, name, a, tra a zone transfer from them. <laughs> and most of the IP addresses in these lists of tens of thousands of devices were these embedded systems with, uh, with severe security problems, such as default passwords. So the, the attackers will find you. And uh, I think some of the best advice to, that you can give uh, people listening that you can give to others is to change the default password. I mean, it's not, there isn't anything like resound. Really, it's changing the password and updating your firmware. And I've seen like the general media get this totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, this is really easy thing, right? Change your password and update your firmware. Yeah, and, and one of the things I always try and communicate, because if you want somebody to take action, you have to tell them kind of how it hurts them. And if they have that mindset of who's going to hack my network, I, I don't have anything really valuable. Well, they don't necessarily want to target you. They want to target somebody else. They just need equipment to do it. And so right. you become an unwitting accomplice in that. And and the way I always say it is, have, have you ever been watching Netflix and all of a sudden your video quality gets really crummy? Well, it might not be the cable provider. It might be other people using devices on your network and consuming your bandwidth to do things that is bandwidth you pay for. So effectively, mm -hmm. they're stealing from your pocket. And and that helps to drive that home. I, hey, I, I don't want my webcam attacking uh, you know GitHub or whoever it is that, that's being targeted this month. I. I pay for that bandwidth, I should be able to use it for whatever I want. And and that's what really happens is the hackers, they don't care who you are, they don't care what information you have, they do have a target. That target will be somebody big, somebody who can pay a ransom, somebody who's got some money. You, you're just a means to an end. You and a and hundred thousand other people just like you whose equipment they can grab a hold of and, and that's where the real danger comes in. You're a pawn in their game. Uh, you have uh, a couple of modules in IT Pro TV, and we get a lot of feedback from, from folks that are like, hey, how do I get my start in security? And I think that PFSense is a great way to get started in security. Like building your own home firewall, I've said this on the, the shows before, is a great way to get started uh, just understanding networking, technology, security. Um, so you have a module on PFSense, uh, which is great. And you also have a model, uh, module rather on the uh, home uh, router configuration as well. And it's interesting, our, uh, our audience are security professionals. But when we talk about you know, doing this stuff in your home, people get really excited. Because in your <laughs> home, you're, you have complete control. There's no change requests. Like you can just go learn uh, and play around in your home. So I, I think this is a great way to get started on this. And then also to be able to teach others to do this is important to keep the internet a, a safer place. But I think there's a lot of things that need to happen before we get there. Yeah, and you know, on PF Sense, a lot of people look at it and say, "Well, it, it's open source, and it's not, you know, it's, it's not an enterprise grade product." I really like PF Sense. I've worked with um, literally thousands of Cisco ASAs, thousands of Juniper SSGs, and Net Screens before that. Um, I've used enterprise firewalls like crazy, and they're great, and they're expensive. And for a home user, that's not realistic. You're not going to get a Cisco ASA at home, even if you get the cheapest one. They still eat you alive on licensing, and it becomes oh, yeah. expensive. So that, that's not a practical solution. But PFSense, you can build up a an Atom processor box for two, three hundred dollars, throw PFSense on there and have a great firewall that has enterprise features in it. They'll let it you does. do all the filtering. And if you've never checked it out, jump over to pfsense.org. It's free, right? It doesn't, doesn't cost you a dime. You can bring it up in a virtual machine. Um, I use it in, in production enterprise networks as mm -hmm. well as my, my own personal home network. It's a great solution and a great way to learn firewalls. And 
once you get in there and you work with it and you get kind of the grasp of how everything works, it's the same concepts and theories that move over to the the higher end commercial firewalls. It'll just be a different configuration command. It, it, it's interesting. So not just uh, speed and the ability to do some advanced firewall rules. Also on PF Sense, there are, if you make it your DNS server, you can enable all these modules to do uh, spam filtering. So it can do that at the DNS level. And then you can also apply rules to do it at the URL level as well. So now you've got URL filtering and, spam, and uh, black, blacklist functionality for domain names, as well as a full-featured firewall. And make sure you, you build it up. I like your recommendation of two or three hundred dollars <laughs> to get hardware. Like, don't put it on a Raspberry Pi or, you know, an old Droid. That's, I mean, you could, but your throughput's going to be very limited. I like putting it on at least an Atom processor, as, as you described. I built a ridiculous firewall at home. I, I could run like a gigabit through <laughs> my home. Um, but, and then you can also put VPN on it. So I, I think for that reason, PFSense is uh, definitely the recommendation. We've, we've also, have materials on, on showing people little tips and tricks on PF Sense, uh, and you have the full training module. So, uh, yeah, a couple of, of neat things to think about there is like on the Atom processors, they actually have um, uh, encryption acceleration built into the hardware. Intel does that now. So if you're doing like AES 256, it, it does encryption and decryption pretty fast, which is is good for VPN tunnels. You want a VPN in your home, own home, or whatever. Much more secure way of accessing the stuff at home. Oh, that's the other thing is, which, so which processor series do you have to be on to take advantage of that? You know, I, I don't know when it actually started. What what I normally do is is anytime I build out a new one, yeah. uh, Intel has a, a great website, the ark.intel.com, where they catalog all of their processors. And oh. I'm pretty sure it's any CPU they've released in the last three or four years, I feel like, ha has that encryption acceleration built right into the hardware. Yeah, and, I mean, because the, uh, the 1150 socket, you can put uh, a seller on Pentium or any of the i-series processors in there and those are probably all released in the last three years uh for the most part so and you can get yeah. some of that stuff pretty cheap you're that you're in your two or three hundred dollar build uh price range for sure yeah or, or even if you have a desktop that you phased out or, or whatever those yeah. work great too and then the other thing is there's a lot of extensions in pf sense and there's the, i know there's one really cool one where you can block uh countries by ip so you can say you know what i i'm not talking to any servers in russia or china today right. so let me just block any traffic from those regions. And hackers can always, you know, redirect through other IPs. There's proxies, there's VPNs and stuff. But that'll cut off a bulk of the scanning that occurs. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if you're if you're in Russia, you don't want to block Russia. But if you're, you know, dealing with all localized traffic, you can do things like that. And it all just helps to improve that security. Awesome. Well, Don, thank you very much for appearing on Hack Naked News. Uh, congratulations on your new your new digs, and you'll be streaming uh, your grand opening live tomorrow. Absolutely. Grand openings tomorrow. Uh, definitely check it out on the site, itpro.tv, and we'll have a lot of stuff there. I'm hoping to have my pictures actually hung on the wall by tomorrow. Nice. <laughs> I've got my, my goals. <laughs> awesome. We'll let you get back to it. Thanks, Don. All right. Have a great day. You too.